Mic check one, two, three. Mic check one. Check, check, one, two, check, check.
Right, make them an official in life. Ready? All right. Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started this morning, and I am just delighted to welcome you to this 12th annual Joseph W. Howe Oration and Diagnostic Imaging. Our institution is proud to honor the numerous clinical, radiological, and educational con contributions inspired by Dr. Howe over the past 65 years. Dr. Kettner, the chair of our radiology department, will introduce our oration speaker. And I am very certain that you will find today's oration interesting, valuable, asset to your clinical training. So without further ado, please join me in the celebration of Dr. Joseph W. Howe as we join, as we bring Dr. Kettner up. <laughs> Well, thank all of you uh, for joining us, students and faculty, and uh, thank Dr. O'Reilly and his administration uh, for their constant support uh, of this celebratory event. So let me begin the introduction of our orator, uh, Dr. Michael S. Monteleone. Notice uh, he carries two credentials as a radiologist, one in medicine and one in chiropractic. But uh, Michael's uh, classmate graduated along with uh, Dr. Gary Giebert, uh, and uh, those two um, had the good sense to head off to the Philip Institute of Technology in Melbourne, where they were taught by an icon of the chiropractic radiology profession, Dr. Terry Yoakum, who joins us this morning. So Gary and Michael are toiling uh, under the residency of Dr. Yoakum, and both gain access to the radiology specialty diplomate status, the American Chiropractic Board of Radiology. Michael goes on to practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So Michael always had a stride for intellectual activity, and this career uh, was not any different. This activity brought him to wander in another direction, but that direction was the British West Indies. He attended the American University of the Caribbean in Maris, uh, Montserrat, uh, received his medical degree in 1996. So he, he went through the rigor of this institution and now enrolls in another institution. And he's gonna talk about those experiences briefly and obtain surgical internship in 1997 uh, in a major center, the Carillion. I have colleagues in the Carillion, and uh, one in particular, quite talented, he's double boarded in pain medicine and neurology. So they have a concentrated talent uh, in that uh, institution. So Michael goes on to 1998, finishes his residency in diagnostic radiology now, and uh, that's at the Medical College of Virginia, and completes a fellowship in musculoskeletal radiology at the Medical College, in, again, in, in Richmond. And now his second diplomate is awarded uh, in American Board of Radiology. So where's Michael today? Well, he's medical radiologist at the Tidewater Diagnostic Imaging and musculoskeletal radiologist at the Centera. This is a, an enormous complex um, 
and he has in the past served, in fact, as chairman of the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine at Centera William, Williamsburg Hospital. Now, Logan University with the Department of Radiology has now for 12 years declared this oration as a tribute and celebration for a pioneer in the chiropractic profession, Dr. Joseph W. Howe. And each year, orators, and they're listed on your program, on the back side of the program, you can see from subsequent years, um, the privileged speakers that uh, have stood before the Logan University audience. And each year, these orators have provided superlative lectures, topics ranging from chiropractic, radiology, education, research, and even healthcare policy. And this was designed to reflect the particular skills that Dr. Joseph Howe contributed to this chiropractic profession. But this year, our speaker, Dr. Michael Monteleone, MD, DC, will explore the topic, which is inherently interdisciplinary and collaborative. And I emphasize the term collaborative. It's a fitting topic because it reflects, once again, the contribution of one of the first and loudest interdisciplinary voices in the chiropractic profession, Dr. Joseph Howe. Please welcome back to Logan, Dr. Monteleone to address the 12th annual Joseph W. Howe oration, please. Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Hope you're all enjoying your lunches. I want to thank Dr. Tetner for um, asking me to just do this oration, the 12th annual How Oration. It's an honor and a privilege <coughs> to be asked to do it, and uh, and I thank you very much for this honor. Um, it's been a long road for both professions. I mean, there's been talk on each side about what's DC, DACBR, and MD, DACBR. But first of all, I want to talk more about Dr. Howe. Dr. Howe, as we all know, is an icon in our profession. He's done so much for the profession, it's unbelievable. And I didn't realize, I, re I knew that he did a lot for the profession, but until I listened to his oration that he did a few years ago, and then reading too many articles that I didn't know the, the history behind everything that he's done, and it's, it's simply amazing the, what he's done for, for chiropractic and chiropractic radiology. He's an instrumental figure in the development of chiropractic radiology, dating back to the 50s. I mean, all you have to do is just talk to him and read articles about him and what he's done for chiropractic and chiropractic radiology until you fully realize what this man has done. Dr. Howe is a pioneer in the development of chiropractic radiology. He was instrumental in the American Chiropractic College of Radiology setting up residencies. Um, he's, he's been around for a long time and he's, he's done a great lot of good for the profession and chiropractic radiology. Not only has he done a much for, for the College of Radiology, he's a major influence in radiology residencies. Um, his, his, I see Dr. Howe as the trunk of a tree, and from this tree trunk, he has just uh, trained and taught and done research to just many, many people, and this tree trunk has grown into a full-blown huge oak tree that is just massive. He's, he's done a great deal for radiology residencies. Dr. Howe, again, is a progenitor of chiropractic radiology. There's no doubt about it. He, he's a man of uh, fortune for this, for this profession. A major figure in the development of chiropractic radiology. It's, it's amazing that he was one of the 
founders of chiropractic radiology. He spearheaded it. He did tons of research to get it going. He was just uh, a bull to get this done, and he was, he just wanted to get it done, and he wanted, and more importantly, he wanted to do it right, and, and by God, he did it right. He's had a career that's lasted decades, um, and he's helped and trained many, many people over those decades. Um, like I said, this gentleman is an icon, uh, and he's, to, you know, he's a major influence in radiology. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and for that, and when you talk to people, you talk to colleagues, you talk to other chiropractic radiologists and academic people and, you know, administrators, there's, there's no doubt that this, this man, Dr. Howe, is considered to be the godfather of chiropractic radiology without a doubt. There's no doubt about it. He's done so much for this profession and for radiology. Now, Dr. Howe, like I said before, I see him as a, a tree trunk in the institution of radiology. He's taught numerous, numerous radiologists over the years, many, many, many. And from there, he's, you know, bloomed out, knows radiologists, taught other radiologists. So he's, he's been a, a force in radiology for many, many years. And both directly and indirectly. So like I said, he's taught radiologists, he's taught radiologists, he's taught radiologists. And indirectly, he just, he, he's there for the profession and to answer any questions and to, to help any, any way he could over the years. And he's done that. Here's, you know, a couple people that you recognize. Uh, you know, Dr. Powell has a direct influence on Dr. Yoakum, which Dr. Yoakum was one of his his residents. And, you know, Dr. Howe instilled some uh, good theories, good teaching lessons, good ways to teach. And to this day, it, it shows that um, Dr. Howe has inspired Dr. Yoakum. And the same way with Dr. Kettner, since Dr. Kettner has known him all these years. Now, when uh, Dr. Howe came here in 2000, He's done the same thing. He's inspired Dr. Kettner and Logan College and the residency. And like I said, the, the, the tree trunk is the major part, but it just keeps on going and going for this gentleman. So you can see the tendrils, the branches, the leaves of Dr. Howe just reaching out for everybody. He reached out to Dr. Yoakum, one of his residents. And then from there, of course, we have Dr. Alicia Yoakum, another branch on the tree of chiropractic radiology. So it just continues to grow and grow and grow. And it's a tribute to this, to this, uh, to this gentleman, Dr. Howe. It's just, and the tree, you know what? It's gonna keep on growing for everybody. Now, for me directly, it was a direct influence via Dr. Howe. Dr. Howe's, I think, first resident one of two residents was Dr. Dance. And I first met Dr. Dance here at Logan, like you all are. Uh, he was uh, our instructor in radiology, I think our the last six months. So after Dr. Uh, Dance left, or he, he um, stepped aside, and then it was Dr. Andrew Jackson. So, you know, the branches just keep on growing and growing and growing. So. These two gentlemen were a direct influence on me wanting to do radiology. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun doing that. And I talked to both of them and uh, they said, if you, if you enjoy it, so you, sh you should do it. But the, the most profound effect after this, as, as Dr. Kettner said, is uh, my first radiology professor, Dr. Terry Yoakum. As Norman said earlier, I was one of the lucky two out of our class to happen to apply to do a radiology residency with Dr. Yoakum in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and I think we started that around February of 2000, or 1980. So Gary and I headed down under, and it was two years of, uh, of fun with Dr. Yoakum. And he, He's one heck of a teacher, as you all well know, and he knows how to inspire and dig the best out of everybody. 
And uh, I certainly appreciate that, Mike, because that is my first professor. Oh, always be my first professor. And, you know, you know, Dr. Howe is a professor of Dr. Yoakum. So the tree just keeps on going. So I know this is an old picture, but this is the, uh, uh, I, I just thought this was a great picture that I found. This is in Melbourne, Australia of Dr. Yoakum's residence. And there were five of us. The first one, obviously, everybody knows uh, Dr. Uh, Lindsay Rowe, the dear departed soul, and God rest his soul. He was a very bright individual, very bright individual. He was a, a star. Uh, then after that, um, myself, you can barely recognize me, <laughs> and, and Dr. Giebert came in, and we started our residency with Dr. Yoakum. And from there, it was Dr. Tom Molyneux, who is you know, the head of RMIT in Melbourne right now. So he's at the Royal Melbourne Institute teaching people. And then Dr. Jeff Thompson, who is in TCC. So you can see from Joe Howe to Terry Yoakum to Gary Gebert to coming here to teaching with NARM to Jeff Thompson teaching in TCC and, and Tom Molyneux, you know, is, is teaching in Melbourne, Australia and, you know, even though Dr. Rowe has passed away, his teachings are still with us and in his book that he has done with Dr. Yoakum. An interesting story, in the last, when Gary and I were at the end of our residency and um, we were ready to come to the States and take our, our boards. And I remember, I don't know why I remember this, but Terry came up to us uh, right before we were supposed to leave, I don't know, a month or two and said, I just want to let you guys know that uh, I've made arrangements for you, uh, you two, to stop by uh, LACC to be with Dr. Howe for a few days. And I remember Gary, and we knew why we were going. I mean, it was obvious why we were going to, to get some more knowledge and be you know, kind of tested. So Gary said, oh, good. And I said, uh-huh. And I looked at Gary and I said, you know what? I don't think he's going to take us to Disneyland. <laughs> and it was a, it was a good laugh for both of us. And it, it was a lot of fun. And we went, to, we went there and it was a lot of fun with Dr. Al. It was great working with him and his residents. And th this is a little picture off of um, in Portugal that I, I took that was pretty nice. So I guess what brought me to this is MD versus DC radiologist, what actually is the difference? And I think some of this was spurred on to me by, you know, a couple of radio DACBRs oh, in Chicago many years ago, three, four, five years ago, there were two DACBRs uh, that were from New Zealand. And we were out one night, with, you know, with Dr. Yoakum and Alicia, and, and they asked me, well, you know, what's the difference between, you know, a DC and an MD radiologist. And I said, well, you know, I guess there's a few differences. It's, it's hard to explain, but, you know, there are some differences and some of them, you know, mo is most, most of it is the same, but there's a lot of it that's different. So I just wanted to go through the differences to give you an idea, uh, or, you know, what I've gone through. And what helps me is when I, left Australia, I had a private practice of radiology in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and all I did was practice radiology. And I had my own fluoroscopic unit and my own table. So I took, I read x-rays and did my own studies. So, and I did that for 13 years. So I have a somewhat of a unique perspective of, of both sides of the fence. So for both of us, a DC or an MD, it doesn't make a difference. First, you gotta get your degree. I mean, you just have to get your degree. There's no way around it. So we both attained that. So that's not a problem. But I have to say, going through my medical residency, not my medical residency, through medical school, that the training I received here at Logan College in radiology was far superior to the medical training I got in radiology as a, a medical student. There's no doubt in my mind that 
when you get out of here, you'll know more musculoskeletal radiology than a uh, MD that's just graduating. And some of that is because the MD is taught that to refer to another uh, specific uh, person, like a, if you don't know what it is or you want to find out more, send it to a pulmonologist. If you want to find out what radiology study you need, talk to the radiologist. So it's you're kind of like the doctor's doctor, but there's no doubt in my mind, you all are going to be more prepared to do musculoskeletal radiology out of Logan than an MD is out of medical school. So after you get your degrees, you have to apply for radiology residency. For the DACBR, uh, I remember that Gary and I went to many places, uh, Kansas City and a few other places in Chicago, to talk to Mike Beal and Ray Conley to, to look at the residencies and, and apply for them. So the DACBR has to apply for the residency. Now, when I got out of my medical school, I also applied for radiology residency, but for the medical part of it, it's through a match program. It's like, I don't say, okay, I, I went to MCV. I don't say, I want to go to MCV, so you got to take me. And it, do, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. You have to be, you pick them and then they have to pick you. And then it's, it's up to the match the way the computers do it. Like I said, we have to go to the match and, you know, and the dice go where, where they lie. You just don't know where you're going to end up. At that point, where I'm still trying to go through the match, the MD trying to go through the match, you know, the DA, the DC that wants to do a DACBR is probably already accepted to one or two or maybe more programs. And unfortunately for the MD radiologist, we just have to wait and wait. And for radiology, radiology is a five-year residency. Um, I, in that five years, the first year is your intern year. So I had to do an, even though it's considered part of radiology residency, I had to do an inter, intern year first. So when I went around the United States applying or applying for a residency and talking to people, not only did I have to talk to the people in radiology, I went to the people in internal medicine or the ED, depending on what I want to do a transition, it's to say, I'm do, trying to get a radiology residency here, and I need a tra uh, transition year, a first year here, so this is what I'm doing. And, and it was fine by them, because they knew that you were there only for a year, you weren't taking up their slots, and you were going to be uh, a, a work dog, is what you were going to be. You were just going to do their, their scut work, which is fine. That's how you learn, and it, was, it wasn't too bad. Um, just to let you know, as far as the medical profession for radiology, in 2018, there were 1,398 applicants for a radiology residency across the United States. Just that's for the applicants. There was only 965 radiology slots at 178 institutions. So you can see that just because you're applying for the radiology residency doesn't mean you're going to get it. It just, it's up to the match and you may not get it. That's just, you know, it's the toss of the coin. And if you don't get it, you have to decide what you're going to do. Try again next year or, or do something else. And when we do this, you hope and pray that where, you cho where you've been chosen to do your radiology residency, that you can do your, you do your internship because you really don't want to move to one place for one year and then move again to do your radiology residency. It's, it's a, a big work, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And again, that is up to the match too, unfortunately. So you're just like, oh, I hope to get it in the same spot. Unfortunately for me, I didn't. Um, and you just wait for the match day. Everybody just sits out and waits, waits to hear and you just hope that you get to do the, uh, the internship where your radiology residency is. For me, I got chosen to do the radiology residency in the Medical College of Virginia. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get picked to do my internship in, in Richmond at the MCV. I got uh, picked to do a surgical internship at 
at Roanoke Carilion Hospital. And, and it was pretty good. Um, I was skeptical about applying to do a surgical internship. Uh, again, they knew that I was only there for a year. So, and, and when they saw me, I was not your typical, you know, young person coming out of medical school. They knew that I already was a doctor. And, you know, and they all respected that I was a chiropractor and that I was a chiropractor for the island. And they always addressed me as doctor. There was, they didn't care. They just wanted you to do the work and that was it. So, but I must say, doing surgery for a year, I was with them three or four days out of the week in the surgical unit doing surgery. And the other day, day or two, we were in the clinics, but surgery was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun. The only thing I didn't like about it is you had 15 to 18 hour days and it was just gruesome. It was gruesome, but it was, it was fun doing surgery on people. It was fun. And the radiology program, it's a, like I said, it's a five-year program. Um, and the DACBR program is a three-year program. And DACBR goes directly, you know, to the residency program. So you start from day one where, like I said earlier, I had to do an internship. And like I said, mine was in surgery. So while the DACBR is already, all right, gung-ho into the radiology residency, I had to wait a year. So uh, you... The DACBR was already done with the year of radiology residency, and I wasn't even started yet as an MD. Uh, and then finally, you get to, you know, your radiology residency. And the second to the fifth year of radiology residency was um, uh, very intense. It was um, a lot of work. And, and lucky for, the, you know, the DACBR, they get, they get to pick where they want to go, and they chose. Like, I was picked. And Gary was picked to go with Dr. Yokeman, Australia. And we said, well, we don't even have to think about this. We're going. So, and uh, so that worked out great for us. So in essence, even though it's a five-year program, because they say it is a five-year program, I'm only, the, the MD radiologist only does a four-year program in radiology. Um, and yours again is the DACBR is a three-year program. So it's, you know, pretty similar. It's pretty similar. Um, and the programs, they're, depending on the institution you go to, they could, they could pick two radiology residencies or they can pick up to 20 radiology. A small hospital in Maine may only have room for two radiology residents where MCV, we had, room for like 40 to 50 residents so that that was pretty good so when you when you do that you have a lot of residents so at mcv when i got into their radiology residency there was you know a lot of radiology residents and throughout the four years i mean you figure if you're picking two to 20 residents a year you have a lot of radiology residents so then there, MD radiology program, you can have anywhere from 16 to 80 residents in one program, which is a heck of a lot of residents. As far as the DC radiologists, I think what I found through my research, it, it depends on the institution that I would take two to six radiology residents. And it depends on the money and how things go. For the MD part of it, when we're chosen, uh, to do that residency, no matter if it's family medicine or ED or pediatrics or whatever it is, um, our salary, if you can call it that, was paid for by the federal government. It wasn't coming out of the hospital. So we were paid every year. But believe me, for the amount of work that we did, it wasn't enough money. It was, it was ridiculous. And, and it depends on uh, the DC radiology program. You can have anywhere from six to 18. But again, that that depends on each program. And I mean, there's similarities between the MD and the DC programs. Um, we all have to do the, the straight foundation stuff. You know, the MDs and the DCs do musculoskeletal radiology. It's the same. Uh, ultrasound is incorporated in MSK radiology through the DC program. Both professions do neuroradiology. Both professions do radiology of the thorax. 
both professions do, radiology of the GI system. Both professions do radiology of the GU system. And unfortunately, or every one of us on both sides of the aisle, we have to do physics. And I think out of everything, I did not like physics. And none of us did for that matter. It was just very painful. But you know, you can see the parallels are still there. I mean, we're side by side, basically doing the same thing. Uh, but to go even further, uh, our training is a little bit more involved. Um, after those initial areas, I went ahead and did as an MD, angiography, interventional angiography. When I'm talking about that, that means I'm going in and doing balloon angioplasty at two o'clock in the morning to open up an artery. Or uh, there was a aneurysm in the brain that, that uh, unfortunately burst. So as the resident at that time, you go ahead and start the process for the neuroradiologist, the interventional neuroradiologist, to go ahead and do some coil embolization of the MCA aneurysm. So it's, uh, it's involved and it, 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 at times it gets scary. Then cardiovascular, that's somewhat new. You're doing that through a lot of MRI, cardiovascular work. Nuclear medicine, like I said, when I say nuclear medicine, it's just not bone nuclear medicine. It's brain, it's kidneys, it's, it's everything. It's, uh, and it's on adults versus newborn kids. Uh, breast imaging, it, we all do a portion of breast imaging, but you have to really like to do breast imaging. It, it is a lot of fun, but it's not something you want to do part time. It's very litigious and you learn while you're doing rotations through the residency that you, you just can't slack off there's it's just too it's too detailed and once your eyes are attuned to breast tissue and the tiny microcalcification you got to stay with it you can't do it once a week or you lose it we, we do OBGYN ultrasound uh, pediatric radiology and that goes far as soon as they're born to you know to their a pediatric person and you know our experience and my experience is when you're on call to that point and you're the person in the hospital responsible for peds they get a newborn and they want to know if there's a bleed so you go up there as the md radio or the, the training radiologist and it's on your back to tell them if there's a bleed in this this uh this born person and it gets scary because you are the person you're the end part granted the the titani comes in the next day but they rely on you because they need something done now they can't wait till tomorrow morning and then the abdominal ctmr it's it's you know you all do that too and through the dc program um once we got into our more advanced stages where they actually trusted you there was three types of call that I had to do as an MD radiologist. Um, like in the third, starting in the third year, in the fourth year, we had ER call where you, I'm using my experience at MCV. I was the ER call radiologist or radi radiology resident on call. I was there <clears throat> from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. five days a week. And, and I was by myself. And anything that came through the ER, I was, that was plain films, CT, MRI, and ultrasound, I had to read. It was my responsibility. And it's, um, once you, the first time you do it, you get scared to death because I went to MCV as a level one trauma center and we saw everything. I mean, we saw people come in that were drunk and jumping over, you know, uh, fire pits and catching themselves on fire. Uh, people that were shot and stabbed, they were brought in by cars by their buddies, opened the door and shoved out, and you had to attend to them. And you're talking about bad stuff where we had to do angiograms to see what was going on. It was, it was a mess. It was a mess. Um, but it, it's, it's uh, you get used to it, and actually it was a pretty good training tool. I mean, it really prepared you. 
Um, and then we went to imaging call. So you were done with the ER call. It's like, thank God, because that was very painful. But imaging call was even worse because you're the, the resident that is responsible for the entire hospital. And MCV was 12 to 1500 beds. It's a big hospital. And so you're responsible for reading CTs, MRs, and ultrasounds, and any interventional study that comes up. So if you had to do it, they called you to do an angiogram at two in the morning, you were doing it. And you were just doing it, or you were doing a lumbar puncture. But any procedure we had to do, and you have to remember, we're still residents in training, but you went through the, the cycle enough where you do what you were doing because they wouldn't let you do it if they had any reservation. And we were tested every year. I mean, it was it was it was good. Then once you get done with those two calls, then you get to the the mecca of calls, uh, what the what we call senior call. So it was on our, it was in our fourth year um, where you were in the hospital, you know, all the, all night, and but is the senior call back up in the hospital. You were the guy that came to when nobody could do it or they had questions. So, and but the thing is nobody, the ER call and the imaging call, you just never bothered the senior call because it was it was like one of those taboos. You just don't mess with the, the senior call guy because they were the fourth year and they were ready to, to take their boards. But it, it's the rite of passage and it's one of those things you just deal with. Um, Norm knows this well. This is up in the Sandia Mountains overlooking Albuquerque, New Mexico. This not that many years ago. He was running up and down these mountains. Not that many years ago. Okay, our resident workout, just to give you an idea, they, they, were, they were pretty involved, but I think th there's a parallel between both. I mean, we work 7 a.m. to 5 or 6, and, and so does the DACBR. We did that in, in uh, in uh, Australia with Terry. And then you are in the program and you work through the section of science. So, uh, you know, you may be MSK and then you're going to be neuro here. And, and it's the same way with, you know, the, the MD portion of it. Uh, you read the studies by yourself, you get them all dictated, and then the attending comes in and makes sure that you're reading them right and then you sign them off. And it's no different than what. Dr. Kettner did yesterday when I was here. It's the same exact thing. There's no difference. Um, we did noon residency lectures, and it's done here. And it's done everywhere in every residency department. So the parallels are there, but there are there certainly are differences. Um, one of the big differences is when I was a resident, I just said, and I wouldn't say I was in neuroradiology, well, we were doing procedures. We were doing tunneled catheters. We were doing thick lines. We were doing, uh, we're putting in tunnel graphs. We were doing declots of that. Uh, we were doing, you know, brain uh, angiography. So, and in PEDS, it's, you know, it's, it's different, but you're still doing procedures. It's just not sitting in front of a view box. You're actually, you're, you're on fire when you're doing procedures. You have to be careful, but, the attendings are there to make sure that you're not doing any harm. Um, from there, I wanted to go and kind of give the, the difference between the, the MD certification and the DC certification. It's kind of basically the same to a degree. Uh, the, the MD certification exam is three sections, and so is the DC. Um, the MD first section is pure physics. It was all day physics written questions, and it, it was just painful. Um, and you have to pass that to even go on to do the second, third section. In the same way with the DACBRs, your first section is two days where you did physics, bone and joint, thorax imaging, neuroimaging, abdominal imaging, and you all must pass. The, DAC, the DACBR has got to pass to be able to sit part two, which is which is normal. You just got to do that progression. If you don't pass it, you don't do the next section. My section two, as far as an MD, was a two-day written exam on everything that you've learned through the residency. 
No, it doesn't make, and this was just written. So they could ask you anything that they wanted, you know, allergic reactions, what are you gonna do? How much are you gonna give? What are you gonna do if a patient says this? What's your diagnosis? What's your top three diagnosis? What's the percentage of and chondromas going malignant? So they could ask you anything, it was all written. Um, and it wasn't too bad. Um, it was not great, but it wasn't bad. Uh, the DACBR part two is comprised in three different sections, which is imaging, which they do MSK, neuro, chest, thorax, and abdomen. Now I'm getting this from the ACCR website, so hopefully that's pretty correct. Um, and then the other part of this uh, section of part two is the report writing, where they have to re write reports. And I remember doing this is uh, doing my DACBR. And then the third part of their section two is the oral interview, where they look at your reports, they look at your imaging interpretations, and they grill you on the um, cases that you submit to them. And usually it's easier to make those cases as simple as possible so they can ask you a lot of detail. I, you know, learned that the hard way. Um, my, then my, so you're, so the DACBR is all done and you pass and you're all set. I have to go on to the MD part of it. I had to go on to do part three and I, part three was a oral exam um, when I had to fly to Louisville, Kentucky for this. Um, every section was tested. We had two or three examiners sitting behind us, throwing cases up at us and asking you questions. And you were, this was what, this was what, one on one with these attendings and you know, and you know who these guys are because they've written articles, they come and lecture to you, so you're going like, okay, I'm in MSK section. You can't, you know, shine smoke because this is the person that wrote this stuff and he knows that you're just, you know, you know, just faking it. You just can't do it. But it's a lot of sections and it's 20 to 30 minutes per section and they just throw up cases and throw up cases. And it's in all of these, it's an angiography nuclear medicine, GI, GU, PEDS, thorax, everything that you've been taught over those four years, they just grill you on. You, de you just gotta do it. And th the initial part of it was deadly, but it was fun. Uh, the recent changes within the last five years, they changed the MD part of it, where now you can take the first part of the exam only after your third year of residency. And it's a written examination. And after you, then you can't take the fourth or the, the second part of that until 12 months after you're done with your residency. So you're out in practice, you know, practicing with the radiology group before you can even take that. So you have to wait a year after you get out of residency to take that. Um, and, and where my, the last section was oral in front of people, which I thought was great because you can actually work your way around it. All this is done on computer now. So the last section, which is done on computer, is all imaging. So you're you're <clears throat> being tested on images that they put in front of you. So it's it's they've changed it. Some people say it's for the good. Some people say it's not for the good. So after we're done with the residency, we're board eligible as an MD to be a radiologist, you're considered to be board eligible. And then after you pass the, GAN, the exam, you're board certified, which is fine. For the DACBR, there's no such designation after you know you get out of your three years, there's, there's no designation that says you're board eligible. And when you take your exam and say, God forbid you don't make it through, because uh, you gotta make it through to, to be board certified, there's no, no designation that says you're board eligible. You're just, there's like, there's no designation at all. And to me, it's like, you've gone through the three years of residency. I'd like to be recognized as at least board eligible to take my DACBR exam. But that's just me. I think it's something that's, that's earned by the DACBR. But I've been told I've been wrong. Uh, I've had the good fortune of spending some time with um, a medical radiologist in London, so 
and I took some time and did some touristy and stuff. Uh, the fellowship for the DACBR is an ultrasound and MR, and for the MD, it's almost in everything. If it, you know, if it was for me, four years of medical school, and then five years of uh, or, or uh, radiology residency was enough, I decided to do an extra year and do an MSK fellowship, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but I have to say that my time with Terry helped out tremendously. It was uh, it was a great. <laughs> let me tell you, because I can sit at the board with great confidence with great confidence. And I attribute that to that gentleman back there. Uh, recertification is basically the same. For, for the MD, you have to do 30 CME uh, hours a year, which is kind of goofy because in order to keep my, say, Virginia license, I had to do 30 hours as it is. So, it, it, but that's the rules and you play by them. So it's easy to do. My, I have to recertify on a computer. They give me computer cases, and I have to take this online examination. It's, they call it the OLA. And mine is geared towards MSK, so everything I get is MSK, which is great. And then the bad thing for their recertification for the MD part is you got to do a research. Now, if you're an academic institution, it's great. You got the time. Private practice, you have no time to do research. Uh, for the DACBR, from what I read through the ACBR, it's 60 educational credits over a period of five years, which is kind of ridiculous because I know you all, the DACBR, does a heck of a lot more than that. But that's what's written down. Um, so how many radiologists are there? MD radiologists, and these are recent figures, there's 34,000 to 40,000 medical radiologists in the United States. Um, and for 2018, there was over 1,300 radiology uh, jobs for radiologists. So that's a lot of jobs for radiologists in one year. For the DC, from what I gathered, and some of this information was very hard to get, there's between 250 and, and 400 DACBRs. And I couldn't get a, I couldn't lock down a figure from anybody. Uh, and then, the amount of positions is going to depend if you're going to open up your practice or go into academics, or it just depends how that's going to be. Uh, this was in um, Spain, in Barcelona. The number of studies read, um, from what I gather, uh, for the DC, it seems to be the ACBR is a little bit variable because uh, a lot of, I think, from what I understand, a lot of the DACBRs have a mixed radiology practice and clinical practice. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's kind of the information I got. And a lot of it is playing films. For, for, for me, anyway, as far in my practice, um, there's a lot of films read. So depending on your size, your institution, you can read from 8,000 to 26,000 studies a year. For 2018, for me, I read over 23,000 radiology studies last year. Uh, and 30 to 40 percent of what I read was plain films. 60 to 70 percent was imaging, which is ultrasound, MSK, CT, so on and so forth. And that includes the interventional, uh, you know, things that you do while you're you're doing radiology. The esteemed Dr. Kettner at his radiology station is no different than my radiology station in Virginia. We should both use the Carl's table. Um, this is a the Barco monitor that's pretty big. Uh, this white box here is where we dictate a report. It comes up, we dictate in real time, and so whatever we say comes up on that box. And when we're done reading it, you sign it off, and it goes to the doctor immediately. Uh, the background on that here is all the radiology studies for that patient, no matter how what it is and what the reports are dating back to the, your entire time at that facility. And the far left one here is all the clinical information, what their surgeries have been, what the labs are, what their path is. So it helps us get an idea of what we're looking at because half the time when we get you know, something to read, it's either trauma or pain. It's like, well, that tells us mostly nothing. Um, I, the daily work schedule, 
is, you know, 7-Eleven in our practice. There's a radiologist there, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Saturday and Sunday, there's one lone radiologist in the house that does everything from 7 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. And the holidays are the same. Now, what I found out in general in my practice when I was in Albuquerque, I was working, you know, between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., and I never had nights, never had holidays, and never had weekends. So it was it was a pretty nice schedule. Um, for my work week at my practice, uh, the you work from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So you do the work, and on any given day when we walk in, there's anywhere between 40 and 60 studies waiting for us, and 30 of them could be MRIs. Uh, the call radiologist or us comes in at 3 p.m. and they stay till 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and they do all this, they read all the studies and do any procedures that come up. Then after 11 p.m., a reading service takes over and we're able to go home. But if something comes in the middle of the night where you have to drain a kidney abscess or an abdominal abscess or do a lumbar puncture, you have to get up at 2, 3, 4 in the morning and come in and do it. Where my schedule as a DACBR was 8 to 5. Yeah. Barely worked after five o'clock, never worked on weekends, but that depends on your situation too. There's the ACBRs that work in conjunction with medical radiologists, and that certainly could be different. Uh, malpractice costs is a big one. Um, from what I gathered from NCMIC, uh, it ranged from 650, which I found hard to believe, to three and a half thousand a year. Uh, medical radiology malpractice averages between 11 and 80,000. The 11,000 is when you first get out and you haven't read any studies, so there's not a whole lot of people to sue you if you miss something. But the more that you're in practice, the higher it gets because the more studies you're involved with. My malpractice for this year is $32,000, just to let you know. It's a vast difference, but there's a reason for that. Um, both factors, DC, DACBR, misdiagnosis. You think it's uh, enchondroma, it's uh, chondrosarcoma. It doesn't make a difference. It's a misdiagnosis. On the other hand, you just don't even see it and don't mention it. And, and, it, and that's a problem for every one of us. Um, it, it, it was, it's quite interesting. You've got to see it to diagnose it. Uh, to go further and why my medical practice is 32,000 is because of my procedural complications. Uh, I have vascular injuries when I'm doing biopsies. Uh, I've gone through the aorta and luckily it didn't cause any problems, but these things happen. I've had, you can't read 23,000 studies a year and do procedures and, and be 100%. It's, whoever says they don't never cause any harm or miss stuff is wrong. It's just not caught. Uh, vascular, my complication in needle biopsy, when I do it, when I'm biopsying that adrenal lesion, you're going to bleed, you can have an infection, or I can damage it, or you could die. You just, that's just the way it is. You have to tell them this. And then you delay the procedure, or you don't give them enough information to the, um, to the patient. Um, and then there's not enough communication. And I tell you, no matter what profession you're in, talk to the patient, talk to the patient. Because if you're nice and talk to them and tell them everything and something goes wrong, they're going to be on your side. There's no doubt about it. Uh, this is some of the why my malpractice is, is so high. This is uh, a biopsy I did at this soft tissue nodule. Now, well, obviously, we did a CT beforehand and we found this, and now we're doing the biopsy. So the patient is prone. These are windows that we use for biopsy and, you know, the spine and paraspinal muscles. And so I'm biopsying this this little soft tissue nodule. So you got to, you can see where it's next to the aorta. That can cause a bleed. But I biopsy this lesion and the Temno needle we use is 18 gauge. So it's it's pretty big. So you got to watch out what you're doing. This ended up being a melanoma, believe it or not. Another case, ultrasound, they did a uh, submandibular biopsy. Uh, you have to be careful because you can nick a, a cutaneous nerve that goes to the lip and if you do their lips going to be numb so and that's a known complication so i did this biopsy with a long temno needle and this turned out to be a lymphoma and these are all biopsy proven 
Um, lung biopsies, we all cringe at. Even though I'm the MSK guy, we all, everybody does this stuff. It's like, it's the way it is. So here's a, a mass here in the, uh, the lung base. So you can see how tenuous it gets. It's near the IVC. It's very deep and it's near the, uh, the hemidiaphragm and the pleural space. So you gotta be careful. And it's not easy because for lungs, the person doesn't breathe the same when you're, when you're putting in the catheter. You can miss easily. Uh, another biopsy. This was uh, another lymph node. Uh, this is a case that I read. If you look real close, there's a subdural hematoma right through here. And it's subtle, but it's there. These are things you give these cases to radiologists. Um, and one of the complications, doing a lung biopsy and pneumothorax. It just happens. Uh, another complication, mass in the kidney. You put in your needle, you get your biopsy, you do another uh, slice, and when you have a huge hematoma, and you hopefully that the hematoma tamponades, so it doesn't kill a kidney by compression, or they have to go in and do a subcapillary drainage of that blood. And it's the same thing, kidney, post-study, another hematoma. And this is a, a parotid biopsy I did. You can see how long the temno needle is. It's, it's a big needle, and it's 18 gauge, it's not small. And this was a Warthin's tumor, but again, going through the parotid gland, the facial nerve goes through it. That's a known complication. If you hit it, facial paralysis, and it does happen. Okay, for radiology, both on both sides, DCMD, it's academics or private practice. Um, you can be solo practice or a group. Most of the MD are, are group practice. You just can't do it by yourself. And for the DACBR, it's the same thing, solo. A mixed clinical are our DC, uh, DACBR, uh, and usually a group of, of two or greater. And like I think Dr. Yoakum's been got three in his. Um, the MD is usually in a group practice greater than two. Most group sizes in a radiology um, function is between eight and 100 radiologists in a partnership. So. We had like 25 in our group, 25 partners. And it varies um, drastically for the DAC bar. It just, just depends what you want to do and how you want to approach you know, your practice. Um, most groups range from eight to 100. Most, you can be hospital for MDs. You can be owned by the hospital and they pay, pay you a salary. Or you can be uh, contracting out to the hospital where they build a technical component, you build a professional. Um, this is my one-year-old grandson. Um, I was born and raised in St. Louis, went to Logan. Um, so I had to get him a Logan or a, a Cardinal shirt, but I think I'm gonna have to switch this to a blues shirt. Um, and this, and the, the payment is basically the same, the technical and professional components. You're owned by the hospital, they bill for both, and you're a salaried employee, they pay you a, a stipend. Um, or you can be a contract radiology and deal with the hospital, and they bill for the for, uh, technical, we bill for the professional. Uh, and it's the same way, it's no different for the DACBR. Um, you do it in your office, or you read, you're gonna bill, uh, you can bill for both components, or you bill the referring doctor. Um, or you can bill for the reading service from the referring physician or the insurance company directly. When I had my practice in Albuquerque, we did a little bit of both. And I'm kind of like winding up here. I know you all have to go, but I want to show you the, some differences here. Um, <clears throat> I got these figures off the internet for, our, uh, for the chiropractic college for cervical spine, three views, $61, and so on, five views, 66, seven views, so on and so forth. For the hospital that I'm at, the spine two to five views was anywhere from four to seven hundred dollars. Extremities was five forty-eight, chest five oh four, hip and pelvis nine hundred. Do we get paid or does the hospital get paid that? No, but they usually get fifty percent, but fifty percent of seven hundred is pretty good and it's certainly more than sixty-one. And I have issues with how the insurance companies pay for this. Um, some of our imaging costs, CT head, 2,000, MR head, 5,000, the head, neck, 8,000, chest, 
and so on and so forth. But what I wanted to show you, this is back in March of 2018. This is through the ED. So this patient got a CT or a CTA of the chest, which is a PECT. They got a head CT. They got a VQ scan, which makes no sense because the gold standard is the CTA, the pulmonary embolism CT, and they did a PA of the chest. So just a radiology bill for this patient that walked into the, the ED was $8,300. That doesn't include the $450 of walking in that you're automatically charged, and you're going to get a bill from everybody else. This is just radiology. The same way with this. Um, and if you look at the it's mid-abdominal pain. So this is through the ED. This is what they've done. A CT of the abdomen and pelvis. A CT of the head. MRA of the chest, which is basically a, a PECT. An abdominal ultrasound is the AR to see if it's ruptured. And then a chest. So when you look at all these fees, just one person within a span of three or four hours, their bill was over 16000 just for radiology. I remember as a practitioner arguing with the insurance companies to get paid hundred dollars for a five U cervical series, but they're gonna go and pay sixteen grand or eight grand for this. I thought it was ludicrous. This is the Amalfi Coast in, in Italy, this is Cincaterre. Uh, the licensure and reading studies for me, a found license Virginia, I can't read a study from North Carolina. Pennsylvania. I have to be licensed in those states to read studies from that state where that's not the case from what I understand except for three states where you don't need to have a license in those states to read, which is which is kind of nice. But I think this is flux and I think that may be changing. But if I want to read studies for a, uh, a person in North Carolina, I have to have a North Carolina license or I'm practicing without a, a license in that state. So just to summarize, there is differences. There is a difference. The big difference is the hours that we keep, the malpractice, the, the inherent issues of hurting the patient. And you know, obviously you try not to hurt the patient, but that's part of it, unfortunately. And, and the errors are, they're not that much there. Our group is pretty good. We have a very low uh, uh, problem with you know, issues after doing biopsies and stuff. But uh, it doesn't make a difference to me what, you know, what you do, what profession you're, you all are out there seeing patients. And the best thing for you is to use the people that you have around you. It's good for you to refer to Norm or Terry or anybody because what you're trying to do, you're getting information from the professional, the the field specific radiologist to help you. And that in turn helps the patient. And let's face it, mm. we're all here for one reason. It doesn't make a difference. We're here to help the patient and that's what it's all about. And that's exactly what it's. So you can't have any kind of bias. Um, this last slide that Dr. Howen is and his wife Dee, I mean, like I said, he's been around for many, many years, trained a lot, a lot of people. And this gentleman has done a great deal for chiropractic in the field of research, clinical teaching, and radiology. And to imagine what this gentleman, Dr. Joseph Howe, has done for the practice of chiropractic, for the practice of chiropractic radiology, and in training of chiropractic residents is phenomenal and needs to be applauded and appreciated for his efforts, what he's done over the many years. And he, he deserves a big rounds of applause for what he's done. And we all appreciate that. And, and I, I certainly did. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I know you all have to go, you know, do things. But Any questions from the audience for Dr. Martin? You know, if, anyway, if you <laughs> or eat your dinner. Or anybody? I thank you for showing up. Right. I appreciate it. Oh, okay. There is a question. Uh, Yell it out, please. <laughs> so, uh, we were applying to medical school, um, and I know it's not very much different than what you're doing, but what's the difference between applying to medical school and applying to medical school? Because I know that there's a lot of different things that you can do. 
Knowledge wise, it was great. It was fantastic, but no, you had to do the whole four years again. But I'm telling you, what you learned through Logan or any other chiropractic college, 